Um, thank you all for having me. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I admit I landed about two and a half hours ago, three hours uh, off of the red eye, so, uh, but I'm full of energy for the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about how um, we are democratizing data. So a little bit of what I'll cover, what is Data University, why we built it, how we scaled it. Um, we have, I can't even keep up, we have 20 something or 30 something offices at this point. Um, how we measure our impact and just a summary of our high level learnings. So what is Data University? It's a data education and training program for everyone at Airbnb. I think this is, um, from other programs that I've heard about, we met with a couple other companies in the Valley and a lot of the educational focus for technical learning um, is really focused on technical employees and we wanted to take an approach where everyone uh, was able to come to class and up level their skills, not just the data scientists, not just the engineers. So our vision uh, in that vein was to empower every employee at Airbnb to make data informed decisions by providing data education that scales by role and team. So it was a really customized approach depending on who uh, was in the classroom. So this goes, I, I kind of see this as a case study as to what Robin was talking about. Um, it's, we have taken an experiential education approach. Um, I have a background in that from my job previous to grad school. Um, I used to do uh, tours around Washington, D.C. with middle schoolers and teach them about leadership through the lens of American history and government. Um, and so we kind of took that approach and applied it to data. So we do hands-on practical learning. Um, we often have classes with people from all different sides of the company. So there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of ways that people can learn from each other and what other teams are doing. We use real business examples. Um, and we have faculty from all over the company as well that can lend their expertise and their, um, uh, their view of um, their roles uh, into the classroom. So a few high level stats, we're now almost at a third of the company. We've had uh, over 400 classes held. Uh, does anyone, net promoter score, does that yeah. resonate? So it's the percentage of people who would recommend taking the class minus the percentage of people that would not recommend taking the class. Um, and 60 is generally a, a pretty good score. We're pretty proud of that. And we have over 50 trained faculty. So why did we build this? I, um, a little bit of, background, I started in 2011, I was supporting the customer service team, and I was the only data scientist when I started, or supporting that team, when I started there were about 100 customer service agents, and then about two or three years later, there were almost 2,000, um, and it was still just me. Um, and so we, we started a little selfishly teaching people data skills so that I could just get a little help. Um, and that's, that's where it started, and, and we started teaching just the hard skills. We started teaching just SQL querying language. Uh, but what we realized is that without context, um, it really didn't resonate. Uh, so we redesigned this program in 2016 to start with the critical thinking skills and then move into the hard skills. So we really see, this, this is a, a Venn diagram that my colleague uh, put together which is how we view data literacy. I saw in all these slides it was called numeracy. That's another way to talk about it. Um, and so we see it as the intersection of data education, data access, and data tools. So it, why this is important, we think it really informs decision making. If you know what's happening, um, you can make better informed decisions. And it allows people to have uh, sharper context. So the idea is that Normally you would go to a data scientist and you would say, all of these things are happening, can you tell me what's going on? And we can definitely help, but the person who is in the middle of the work has a lot more context in a lot of ways. And so if they have, can up-level their data skills, they, they might be able to make an even more informed decision than a consultant or the partner data science can. Um, and then also when people know or have access to all of these things, it encourages self-service. So this goes back to my original story of, of getting some help, uh, it allows people to self-serve and not necessarily rely on uh, data science. We have um, thousands of employees and only about 120 data scientists. And there are even some teams that, that don't have data science support. So it really helped us bring everyone along with us. 
So we had pretty good data access and data tools. Uh, in 2016, we have a, a team called our data platform team and they build amazing tools that are open sourced. Lots of companies use them. Um, and access was there, but we were really missing the education. And, or sorry, we, were, we, were, we realized that we had the access and the tools, but we didn't have a lot of people using them. So these are two of our peers. We did a survey in early 2016 and we saw that only about a, a fifth of our company was accessing data tools or using them. And this includes looking at a dashboard. <laughs> so this made me very nervous when I saw this to know that 80% of the company was flying blind. Um, and so we realized that we, had all of, we were investing in all of these tools, but we really needed to teach people how to use them. A note about, this is from the, the lawyers, uh, a note about data access and privacy. I just want to point out we follow GDPR. Um, everything's anonymized. We audit and log everything. Uh, access does not mean that you can look anything up. Uh, it, it, there's no personally identifying information in our data. So back to the presentation. Um, so again, our data ac tools and access were working well, but we were really missing this component of data education. And what we really needed to focus on was how to problem solve with data, basic statistics, which many people, um, who took their last math class in high school or, or university, right? Or, or have worked with statistics, right? I think it's something that, and unless you keep up with it, it's pretty easy to, to forget. So we wanted to do a refresher of basic statistics, um, how to actually use our tools, and an understanding of experimentation. Most of the changes that we make to the website, we perform experiments, uh, A-B testing to see how people respond. And, and so it really takes an understanding of how that works before you can move forward with decisions. And then the most important thing, I think, is how to tell stories with data. So when you go into a meeting, you can look at a graph and not just show something, but you can say, what what is happening, why it's happening. So in summary, we wanted to promote a shared process for problem solving with data. I'm not gonna go into the curriculum, but just a high level overview. We have a, a data 100, 200, and 300 level. 100 level is really that um, critical thinking piece. How do you define a problem? Um, how do you interpret a graph? All of these kind of base skills. The 200 level goes into the harder skills, so where we teach some basic SQL coding skills. Um, we have an Excel class. We uh, teach how to build dashboards in a couple of different programs and how to do experimentation. And then our 300 level is really for our data science and, and kind of hire data skilled employees to up level their skills. So I'm not gonna go too much, but find me if you'd like to talk more about the curriculum. So I wanna talk about how we scaled it. Um, I'm in San Francisco. Mm, I think, I'm not sure exactly the percent, but a, a large percentage of our team is in San Francisco, but we have offices all over the globe. We have, um, our second largest office is actually Dublin. Um, we have Portland, Singapore, those are major hubs. And so what we did is we essentially selected faculty in those hubs, and um, those hubs co cover the regional office demand. So we have faculty in Dublin that we trained um, that if there's someone in a, one of our European offices, they'll either go to that European office or they'll, the people from those offices will go to Dublin for a session. So this is what it looks like. We, we I, I should say we, I traveled <laughs> to, um, in 2017 last year, um, I was on the road for about three months um, and I went to five or six offices and I trained um, a bunch of faculty in each of these three offices. And then our other offices will map to, to the hub offices. We also offer classes in San Francisco regularly, so if someone's traveling to San Francisco, they can sit in on classes while they're there as well. So what we did is we provided a faculty onboarding program. So while I was in Singapore, Dublin, Portland, um, I met with the group for a series of courses to cover things like the philosophy, experiential education, that it's not just sitting and lecturing uh, for an hour. It's, it's um, as Robin mentioned, this, this isn't typical. I usually, I have a rule that I usually try not to talk for more than seven minutes before someone, uh, before the class does something interactive. Um, and so it's a constant back and forth. Um, because if it was just a lecture, I could just make a video and they could watch it, right? That's, and that doesn't actually pan out to be very successful. 
uh, we covered things like how adults learn that are different than maybe what they remember from how they learned when they were in school, logistics, they shadow all of the classes they're going to teach. And then I think the most important thing was that um, they had to get up and teach uh, in front of their peers, and which I actually think is more intimidating. If you're teaching a room full of business analysts or data scientists, um, it, it's, it's more intimidating than teaching a, a room full of uh, more beginner types. Um, and then we would give feedback and um, give them more ideas on how they could improve for the next time. We also provide logistical support. So we have a, a person in San Francisco, a data education program manager, and we actually now just hired um, a coordinator who helps book all the rooms. Um, that's actually a big challenge, um, getting a room that will hold enough people for the right amount, the right time. They work with the teams. A lot of our teams in the hub offices are customer service, service people that have to be on the phones or on email at certain times. So there's a lot of logistics. Um, yeah, here are some details. We also do, we also help them with promotion of classes and marketing. And then we send the faculty constant reminders and checklists so that they come prepared for the class. So how do we measure impact? This is the big thing. When I did the proposal for this program, we had to say what we were going to measure, how we were going to measure it, what were the goals of the program. Um, and I'm gonna go through four things. It's called the Kirkpatrick model, if anyone has heard of that. Um, the last one, though, if you have ideas on this results one, we'll get to that. Um, we're still working on that. But this is the Kirk Kirkpatrick model of training, um, evaluation of training covers these four components, and each one um, kind of answers a different question, right? So reaction is the extent that people found the training engaging um, and that they would recommend that it was a good use of their time. And so the way that we do this is we send out post-course surveys and we um, calculate net promoter scores. And we have dashboards. These were built in our in-house tool that's all open source. It's called Superset. Um, and so these are just some charts showing by class what's our net promoter score, um, what are the most relevant and interesting topics that were covered, what were the least favorite topics that were covered, um, and then it allows us to kind of iterate on that content. The second one is learning, and that is the extent to which people in the training learned what we wanted them to. And so what, the way that we measure this, it's a little harder. There's selection bias because um, we do assessments. And we've found that you know, this, the best students are the ones who take the assessments. So we have to find more creative ways to get at this. Um, but we do offer pre and post course assessments and exams. Um, and we also do student projects. So it's a way for us to see, are they, are they achieving the learning objectives that we set out? Here's one of our charts. The, the um, tan color was the before class test and the dark pink is the post class test. So you can see that after the class they did better um, than they did before, which is great. Um, the behavior, this one is my favorite one to show because it's been really great. I mentioned that we were seeing, we had all these uh, data tools and people could access them but they weren't doing it, right? And so what happens when they take this class? So this is the degree to which people who came to the class changed their behavior. So we measure this by an increase in data tool usage and then we also give a survey every six months that ask people around the company, um, how often do you use data to make decisions? And we can cut that by team and by role and really focus, and then we can also map that to who came to the class and see if there are differences. Um, and so this is one example um, we have, so Airbnb is a place where you can book a home, right? Um, you may have heard our, we launched experiences, so you can also book tours, um, you know, food experiences or all sorts of things. So our experiences operations team, um, all of the market managers went through Data University in January and February. We did three sessions, San Francisco, one in Tokyo, and one in Paris. And you can see that about 15% of, uh, of this group were accessing data to this data tool, which is basically writing SQL and querying for, um, for data and visualizing that data. You see a big spike during the training session, but then what we've seen is that it just levels off and it's about a 3x um, return from what we were seeing pre-training. And so it's really exciting to see that all of these people came and a lot of them found it useful for their jobs and continue to use it. 
So this last one is the one I was talking about, results. This one is the degree to which targeted outcomes occur as a result of the training. This one is very hard. Um, my manager asked me, I think it was about six months ago, she pinged me on Slack and said, hey, I was just thinking like we should try to show that people are making better decisions once they go to Data University. <laughs> um, and that's a very hard thing to, to prove, right? Um, we don't really want to do experimentation and say half of the company can come to the classes and half of the company can't. And if you can't, then we're going to measure your level of decision making. That's just not something we, we're not, you know, we're not going to do that. Um, there's a selection bias. The people who come to the class are more interested in the topics, are more likely to be data driven, are probably more likely to be using data. Actually, we know that. Um, and so these are the questions we're trying to answer. We can get at things like increased job mobility and increased business performance, but it, it is a lot harder, right? There's a lot of things to parse out of that. But um, so I don't have a good answer for how we measure this. If you have ideas, let me know. Um, but it, it is kind of the ultimate goal is that people around the company will, we will feel like we are a more successful company because people have gone through this program. <coughs> So the learnings, these are very high level, but um, this has come up a few times this morning. Context is key. There are lots of programs out there where you can learn SQL, you can learn R, you can learn data visualization, um, but it really doesn't resonate and it doesn't stick if it doesn't map to your job or if it isn't relevant to you. I actually did an A-B test. I did actually do an A-B test with students um, a couple of years ago where I, I had too many students wanting to take the class, so I randomly assigned half of them to a group and I curated content from YouTube and lynda.com and all sorts of online learnings and then the other half came to class with me um, and it was the same content and the the group that was assigned to engage with the online learning, does anyone want to guess what percent of the group engaged with the content? 30? <coughs> engaged meaning they, they watched the videos, they took the exams. It was actually zero. <laughs> so people say that they really want this content and they, they all the, and I have people from other offices who can't wait, you know, they don't want to wait to go to Dublin for a class or they want, they can't get to San Francisco and they want us to record the video or send them something and that's what I always go back to is that we had that, we had content curated for you and, um, and in, it's not something that they chose to engage with. So um, we really decided to take it slow and that goes to the next thing. This is kind of an Airbnb theme. A lot of the things we built in the company um, have started with uh, small projects that we didn't know how they were gonna scale and we didn't uh, really think about that. We just made it work uh, in a small environment and then scaled it from there. And so right now we are still kind of in the phase of we're doing things that don't scale. We've scaled it across the globe, but we don't let anyone dial in for classes. We don't record classes. Everything is hands-on and in person because we think that that's the best way for people to learn right now. And then the last thing is just survey and iterate. So collect constant feedback. If something isn't resonating or if it isn't relevant, then you know, update it, change it, and make it better um, so that people can get the most out of their time. So thank you very much. That's all I have. Yeah. <laughs>